Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'm working on this Generac GP5500. This one I bought from a local guy who buys and sells power equipment. When he picked it up, the engine was locked. He managed to free it up, get the machine running, and he sold it to a contractor. Well, fast forward two days, the contractor brought it back saying that it no longer runs. So he reached out to me, asked me if I wanted it, and I may have paid a little too much for this, despite the fact that it's clean and complete. You know, I did spend $150. And the engine, I'm not sure if it's good or not. It has compression and it turns over, but the issue is when you turn it over quickly, it makes a terrible sound. So I'm not sure where that noise is coming from, if it's internal or external. Anyway, assuming we sort that issue out, really the only other thing that needs to be dealt with is the tank. When I took the cap off, I did hear pressure release. So I think the vent is clogged up. And also the tank, it isn't terrible, but I wouldn't say it's great either. It looks like there was a rust in there at one time. There's still a little bit. So that should be maybe cleaned up a little more. Anyway, let me get you set up a little bit better. I think I'm gonna try starting it and just see that it makes power. I don't wanna run it too long because I think that engine might be on the verge of blowing. Oh, let's check the oil. And he did mention the oil color was really bad. He changed it several times. He thought maybe it was water. And yeah, I wouldn't say the oil color looks terrible, but it makes me wonder what was in the oil. Was it little bits of metal or was it water? I'm not sure, but I think based on that sound, I would say it was most likely bits of metal. So let's try starting it. All right, let's give this a try. Get the engine on, make the light connected and turned on. The fuel's already on and we'll just give it some choke. Now, hopefully this doesn't blow up. I'm a little nervous about it and the timing could be off as well, which would rip the cord out of my hand, but hopefully that's not gonna happen. Try it with the choke off. And we get nothing. So let's get the airbox cover off. We'll give it a little help with some starting fluid and try it again. Just a little bit, doesn't need much. All right, let's give this a try. Well, we got signs of life. The engine, it would not speed up though. So the light did not turn on. And what I saw actually coming out of the carburetor was flame and smoke. So I'm thinking we have valve issues. These are somewhat known for having bad camshafts where the lobes get ground down to nothing and the valves don't open and close properly. So that is what I'm thinking is the issue here. Of course, we'll find out for sure. Anyway, before I take this thing apart, I think I'm just gonna set you up over by the airbox. We'll try it again just so you can see what I was seeing. Well, we didn't get any flames that time, but I did see a bunch of exhaust coming out of the carburetor, and that is not normal. That should not be happening. So I would say we do have valve issues. You know, even when you look at the back of the air filter, you can see right here where the soot is that there's some exhaust coming backwards through the system. So 
I say we get this up on the lift, we get the valve cover off and get a closer look. We'll check the valve clearance and see if both valves are opening and closing as they should. I'm going to start by getting the spark plug out if I can, just so I can turn the engine over without any compression. Plus, I don't want it to have any chance of being able to start. Not sure if I can get a wrench in there. It's pretty tight. Jeez. Yeah, it's impossible to get that plug out of there. So yeah, let's backtrack a bit. We'll get the tank off first and that should give the access needed. It was pretty loose and it's missing the metal bushing. Well, I may have already found out what one issue is. The pressure that the tank was building was due to a clogged tank vent line. And I went to disconnect it from the air box. And usually that line connects into the side of the air box or maybe the back. And this air box does not have the accommodation for it. So I think this is an aftermarket air box. They usually don't come with that connection. So I started looking around and I found that this line right here actually comes down and is plugged into a barb on the top of the carburetor. And that is not the right spot. It does not vent there. That actually just serves to plug the line. And with the line plugged, the generator might run for a while, but once the tank pulls a vacuum, the fuel will not advance and go into that carburetor. So yeah, that, that's an easy fix, assuming we make it that far. Anyway, let's get that tank off. Yeah, much easier to access this plug. Not sure how you're supposed to do it with the tank on. Seems like a bit of a bad design. Wonder if they use an NGK in here or if it's a uh, torch. I think they use torch. Savior. So yeah, not quite a name brand, but maybe a little better than a torch. I'm gonna start by rotating the engine. I'm gonna watch the valves, make sure they're both opening. And not only that, I wanna see how far they're pushing the valve in. It should be roughly the same. So the exhaust moved a little, and now the intake, I would say a lot. Let's try it again. Yeah, that exhaust valve, it is barely moving. That was the exhaust stroke. And that is the intake. And I wouldn't say that's going down particularly far either, but at least it's more pronounced. So let's rotate it a little more. It should switch to the exhaust. And that's it for the exhaust. That is the exhaust stroke. And that, that valve barely moved. So yeah, I would say the cam lobes, they are most likely shot. But let's just check the clearance real quick. So... With the exhaust valve kind of depressed, we can check the intake. There's a little bit of clearance there. We we'll rotate it till the intake goes down. And that intake did not move much either. 
And yeah, there's a little bit of clearance on the exhaust. So yeah, we got cam issues for sure. The clearance does not seem to be the issue here. And the exhaust lobe seems to be the worst, but the intake doesn't seem a whole lot better. So yeah, unfortunately, the engine needs to be opened up. I do believe Generac has camshafts available for this. And there's a lot of little bits of stuff in here too. Can't quite tell if it's carbon or metal. Well, whatever it is that needs to be cleaned out when we put it back together. Well, the good news is Generac does sell the camshaft still. I found it online for $72. So if that's all this engine needs, I think it is worth fixing. My concern though is not replacing the camshaft. I think the fact that the lobe wore down, it sent little bits of metal throughout the engine. You can see a bunch up here. I'm sure it's throughout everything. And the strange noise I hear when pulling the engine over might be a sign of additional damage inside. So I would say there is a pretty high chance that this engine is junk. I won't know though until I get it opened up. So I say, let's drain the oil. We'll get the power head off, get the engine opened up and assess how bad that damage is. Let's see if the oil gives us any clues. Now the guy said he already changed it a few times and it didn't look right. So the damage was most likely done already. Let's see if there's any other signs of metal in here. It's not coming out very fast. It's almost like there's a piece of metal maybe obstructing it. So the oil is pretty much done draining and it doesn't look terrible. I mean, there is a little hint of metallic in it, but not too bad. I've seen a lot worse. So I'd give this one a little hope. That top plate I took off, it was to gain access to these bolts. The exhaust, it has to come off because it's attached to the stator. And man, those are tight. There we go. There we go. So before you disconnect everything, take pictures, take video, make sure you know where everything goes. So when you reconnect it, you don't get it wrong. Because if you do, then you could cause a short circuit and destroy your power head. So I'm just starting here by removing the AVR. That's the automatic voltage regulator and the brushes.
just going to mark one of the white wires because there's two sets of white wires. It really shouldn't matter which way they go, but I want to connect it up exactly the same way just to make sure. going to leave this like that so I can get a puller in here later if need be to separate the ball bearing from the end housing. Got to completely remove these insulators because to slide the stator off, you really need to clear these studs. And with these in place, it makes it a lot more difficult. I'm going to use this three jaw puller to separate the end housing from the ball bearing. Now, you want to go really easy on this. This aluminum cracks very easily. I have cracked a few, and it's never a fun thing to do. So, this one, the aluminum's pretty clean. There's not a lot of aluminum oxide on it. So, I'm hoping it's going to release without putting up a fight. And a lot of times on ones that are this clean, you don't even need a wrench on the end here. And this one I do need a wrench, so we'll go real easy. And I see it is separating. So I think we're going to be fine on this one. Ball bearing feels good. So let's get the rotor bolt out. This should be a 10 millimeter bolt in diameter. And there's usually threads in here. It takes an M12 1.75. So most likely I'll use some water to build hydraulic pressure to get it off. But first, I'm just gonna loosen the bolt. I'll hit it a couple times with the hammer. Sometimes that'll pop it off. You know, if it's gonna happen, it'll happen pretty quick. Otherwise we'll resort to using some water. There we go. So the plan is three pound hammer, hit that a few times. Don't go crazy because you can bend the bolt. And of course, if you miss, you've destroyed the rotor. That's it.
think I'm going to pull off the blower housing. The noise might be coming from the flywheel as opposed to something internal. So just want to double check that. Gonna rotate the engine manually. And I was hoping there was gonna be some contact between the flywheel and the coil. I'm not seeing that. The nut seems to be tight. And there's no excessive play on the crankshaft. So I guess that's good. It does seem a little bit more quiet without the blower housing on. So it actually may have been hitting the starter recoil. If you look on this cup here, it's really shiny. So that could have been it because it's not super loud like it was before. So I'm going to put the blower housing back on, just rotate it a bit. I think that might have been the issue. I'd say the noise is back. Let's get this out. Nope, still loud. I was hoping it was the starter cup because that is very suspicious. It just seems a lot louder with the blower housing on. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. I think blower housing needs to come off. The head needs to come off. And really everything needs to be torn down. So if this engine has any chance, everything needs to be thoroughly cleaned before reassembly.
cylinder doesn't look too bad. I was actually worried that it was going to be all hacked up from the little bits of metal. But that is not the case. I don't see or feel any imperfections. So that's good. I would say the top end can be saved. May have spoken too soon. I thought this was just an oil ring down here, but that is not the case. There's actually damage on the cylinder going around and I can feel it. So yeah, it's not looking good for this engine. You know, I can see some crosshatch here near the top, uh, but there is also some scarring on the left and the rest of it looks pretty good. But yeah, the fact is that is not a great thing. You know, I'm sure the engine would run like that, but for how long? Anyway, the head looks in decent shape, so I have no concerns about that. It does need to be cleaned up. Anyway, let's get the cover off the engine and see what other surprises are inside. Wow, that is really bad. So I think I know why this engine was stuck. I mean, there's bits of metal for sure in here, but I think this is rust and corrosion. Wow, that is far worse than I imagined. So this is the camshaft in question. You can see the lobe here. There is very little left. And that one's not far behind, but yeah, look at that. That is really bad. So this engine at one point, I would say had water in it. You can see right there, there is a line going across. So it was deep in water. And actually look at the tappets. Tons of corrosion and pitting. And that's why the camshaft wore down in this case. They're in really, really bad shape. So, yeah, this engine, I mean, the guy said it was stuck and he freed it up. And then he sold it. And I can see why it was stuck. This is just a counterbalance weight. It's pretty bad. I was hoping to rebuild this or at least salvage a few good parts inside. But yeah, I'm thinking that's not the case now. Let's get the connecting rod disconnected. We'll take a look at the journal on the crank and see if this is in any good shape at all. But I kind of doubt it. I can't say it completely makes sense, that stain. I mean, this is an aluminum block. So that's wouldn't be rust from the aluminum. 
It's really odd. Not terrible, actually. So there's hope that maybe there's one usable part. Yeah, journal's not in good shape. We got some scarring right there. And yeah, really all around. These gears also look pretty chewed up. And the ball bearing, surprisingly, doesn't feel bad. I'm not sure how. Anyway, let's get a look at that piston. I wouldn't say it's great, but given the rest of the engine, this actually doesn't look half bad, surprisingly. The rings, they're not stuck. Doesn't seem like there's any excessive play on the pin. So yeah, we might have one usable part from the inside of this engine. So yeah, I think it's time to look at plan B. It's just crazy that anything could do this to an engine. And yeah, I'm kind of second guessing myself as far as what did this. I don't think water would have created a stain like that. And it kind of smells a bit like bad fuel. I'm not sure, but it's pretty bad, whatever did it. So where do we go from here? I mean, this engine, it cannot be salvaged. I would say a majority of it is going to be recycled. And we have basically an entire generator and parts up here on the lift and nowhere to go. But I do have a plan B. I have other engines and one of them is right here on this Generac GP5000. This one is missing a lot. It has a bad power head. I've tested it, the rotor is bad. We're missing the tank, the handles, the feet, the wheels, the carburetor, the airbox, and the starter recoil. But the engine turns over and has compression. So I think this one will run. And it's actually a low hour engine. According to the hour meter, there's only 41.2 hours on this machine. So yeah, despite the looks with all this aluminum oxide, I'm willing to bet the internals of this engine are in much better shape than the one we just opened up. So I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to get the power head off much the same way as I did on this one. And once I've harvested the engine and have it up on the lift, we'll start putting this thing back together.
Surprisingly, this engine block cleaned up pretty well. There wasn't really any rust on the blower housing and not really as much aluminum oxide as I thought. You know, there is some, but a lot of it was dirt and dust. Anyway, the next move here, I'm gonna get the power head installed. We'll get it wired up and we'll get the engine connected enough, meaning we'll get a carbon, we'll get the governor hooked up and a starter recoil. I'm not gonna make this thing 100% because this engine, I've never heard it run and that power head, I have never seen make power. So until I know the core is good, you know, I don't wanna spend a bunch of time making this thing perfect. I've got a wrench on the flywheel nut holding this crank shaft still. So this bolt on this generator gets torqued to 29 foot pounds. Before torquing it down, just make sure these feet are level with the surface and make sure the ball bearing is fully seated. And in this case, it's not quite fully seated. So I'm gonna go easy torquing this down. You know, as far as I can tell, the stator is in the bell housing, so it should pull it in. And once it's torqued down, I'm gonna take the spark plug out and just pull the engine over. I wanna make sure the alignment is right because the clearance between the rotor and the stator is tiny. It's like thousandths of an inch and a slight misalignment, the two will make contact and the generator will quickly burn up. So you wanna double check that before trying to start it. The stator should get torqued between 80 and 120 inch pounds. I'm gonna first bring it up to 40 and then I'll bring it up to 90. All right, everything's torqued to 40 inch pounds. I can see the ball bearing is now seated. So I'm gonna bring it up now to the full amount that I'm gonna do, which is 90 inch pounds. The bad engine is donating its starter recoil. And we'll donate a few other parts, including the carburetor and the airbox, and I'm sure a few other things. Just listen carefully when pulling the engine over. Make sure you don't hear any scraping between the rotor and stator, or even worse, any binding. The engine should pull over nice and easy with no compression since that spark plug is removed.
Perfect. It's interesting. The plug that came on this generator was an NGK BP6ES, which seems like the right plug, but the connection here does not match. You need an end like this. So this plug is from the bad engine and this top is not removable. I could clean this up and reuse it, but I'd rather use this one. This one looks to be in much better shape or maybe I have another one that is the correct part. So let me take a quick look. Let's see what I have for plugs. The BP6E, it's a very common size that I see on generators, so I, I'm sure I have a bunch in here. Yeah, in fact, we got one right here. BP6E, BP6E, and BP6E, all brand new. So let's take this one and we'll save these for another day. And never assume the gap is good. Even though it's a new plug, a lot of times they get bent in shipping and the gap can be way off. So on this engine, you want it at about 30 thousandths or just a touch under. And in this case, I think we're good. This engine was actually missing the insulator. So before connecting the wiring back up, I just want to test it real quick to see if this is a floating neutral or a bonded neutral generator. And usually they are bonded to neutral, at least this type of generator. Inverters are usually floating. Uh, these can also be floating as well. And you want to know which type you have because when connecting to the house, you want to have a floating neutral. And usually that's not the case. So got the multimeter set up just to make an audible sound when there's continuity. So between this white wire and this white wire, we should get a connection, which we do because these are both neutral. And this is the ground wire, the green with the yellow. So if it's a bonded neutral, we'll get a beep when we connect it to the white. And we do. So if you wanted to connect this to your house, you'd have to break that bond. And for this generator, that bond is actually up in the control panel. So it's not a simple task. Uh, a lot of times they do have the bond down in the generator head where they literally run a jumper from neutral to ground. So if you want to break that bond, you remove the jumper and then you have a floating neutral, which is probably the way to go because they actually sell special plugs that you can plug into the control panel that'll bond the ground to neutral. So it's much easier just to have a floating neutral and plug that adapter in when you need it bonded and then just unplug it when you need it to be floating. In this case, it's bonded. I'm sure that's the way it's supposed to be out of the box. So I'm gonna leave it like that and it will be up to the next owner 
to make any adjustments needed depending upon how they're going to use it. And look at that. The insulation, it's coming down too far on the terminal. That one looks fine up there. These are pretty close to too far down, but I'd say they're okay. That one's an issue, so I'm going to cut it back just a bit. And this does seem to be a common problem I've seen on a lot of generators. These terminals here coming from the stator, they're really too big for these terminals. You see how much slop there is. And with this insulation coming down onto the area that's supposed to clamp, you could get in a situation where that actually acts as a spacer, like an insulating spacer. And then you're gonna have issues with power output. So I'm just going to cut this back a tiny bit and we should be good to continue. I think that'll be okay. Use care when tightening all these bolts down here. They're really small, they strip out easy. If you use a ratchet, you might strip it out. If you use a power tool, you'll definitely strip them out. This here is the input to the AVR. There's four wires, two blue. That's the excitation winding. That's what supplies power to the AVR. The red and the white is the output to the brushes. It is polarity sensitive. So you want the red wire, which is positive, to go on the left brush terminal. And then the white wire goes on the other side. And last but not least, we need to hook up this plate here for engine cooling. And this is also the governor spring, which holds the throttle open. Without this, the generator at best will only idle. Feels pretty good, but I am going to back off the tension a little just to make sure, especially when reinstalling this, you know, it might change the orientation a little bit. I'd rather have it running a little slow to start with. Check the oil real quick because we're at the point where this thing should start. And we do have oil, but it is low. So I think instead of adding oil, I'm just going to change it, fill it up with some fresh stuff, and then we'll try this thing out.
surprising that it's low in oil with only 41 hours on the engine. This could be the break-in oil. Well, I'm not so sure. That oil does look really clean. All right, you missed it, but I topped it off with oil. It took just over 1.1 quarts of oil. So, I think we're ready. So let's give this a try. Just filling up the bowl. Should run the engine long enough to hear what it sounds like, to know if the carb runs the engine well, and see if the generator's any good. So it looks like we're full. And we are leaking, but I think that was just some fuel dripping down the side of the hose. So let's give it a try. I've got the light hooked up, the kilowatt plugged in. Let's see if this thing works. All right, here goes nothing. Ignition on. Choke on. And nothing. Let's try it with the choke off. No signs of life. Let's check for spark. So hopefully it's just a spark issue and not something else. I mean, the carb could have issues too. So let's try this. Yeah. We got plenty of spark, so that is not the issue. Let me try a little bit of starting fluid and try this again. There we go. It's kind of a tight fit, but I don't think the boot was on there properly. Let's try it again. Take two. Get the ignition on, choke on. had me worried there for a second when the engine showed no signs of life. Thankfully, it did come to life and the engine sounds really good and we're making power. So overall, 
things are looking pretty good. I think the carb though is another story. I had to leave the choke mostly on to keep the engine running well. So let's get that carburetor off and clean it up. All right, let's take a look in here. Don't think it's gonna to be too bad. So engine at least runs on half choke. Yeah, there's some junk in there. Not too bad, but it, it needs a cleaning. That stuff will clog up the main jet. Needle looks good. Let's see if we can get that main jet out. Yep. It's the emulsion tube and the main jet. Let's see if it's clogged. I would say probably not. Nope, it's not clogged. And the emulsion tube doesn't look bad either. So the only thing left here is the pilot jet. And so far I'm not really seeing anything then other than a little bit of debris in that bowl. So it's possible it's not the carb. It could be an intake leak, you know, potentially that insulator I installed or one of the gaskets on either side of the insulator. And the fact that I didn't have an air box on doesn't help either. It's going to run the engine a little lean, but usually it'll run pretty well. Pilot jet. It's hard to tell, but I don't, don't think it's clogged either. So yeah, nothing obviously wrong with this carburetor. Anyway, let's just go through it, make sure it's clean. We'll dip it in the ultrasonic for a bit and we'll try it again. There are several small holes here on the side. Uh, the front one actually looked like it was a little bit clogged. That one is in front of the throttle plate. So that is the main pilot jet that keeps things running when it's idling. And there's a few other holes. And as the throttle opens, it exposes more of those, allowing more fuel in. So those are pretty critical that they be clear when the engine's idling or even when it's running fast with no load on it. And these always supply fuel, whether the engine's running fast or slow. So if these are clogged up, it'll impact its performance at any speed. The pilot jet was a little clogged for sure. The wire wasn't going through initially. Now it goes through without an issue. So that might've been it. And for the main jet, I'm just gonna use a micro drill bit, not to drill it out. I just wanna find the largest one that fits. 
and use it to scrape off the plaque that may or may not be on the sidewalls. It's a pretty big jet. Number 62 fits. And 61 now fits. It did not fit a second ago. So yeah, main jet, it was a little restricted. That should do it. I want to give these a quick try on the pilot jet. This was sent to me by a subscriber. And these are actually, I believe, used in root canals. This particular one, it is a tapered file from 20 to 30 millimeters. And I believe will fit in the pilot jet. So we'll give that a quick try. Yeah. Fits in there just fine. And the fact that it's tapered is really good too. It'll fit a lot of different size jets. So not bad. Yeah, cleaned up pretty well. Let's get it back together. We'll start with the emulsion tube and the main jet. The needle I do not put through the ultrasonic. The solution I use, the Harbor Freight Super Heavy Duty Degreaser, it tends to shrink rubber and the needle is not something you want to shrink. So it was not leaking before and I did not want to cause a leak. Sure the pilot jet is fully seated like that. This is just a spacer. And then the idle set screw holds this whole thing down. And this generator does not idle. So you do not need to drive the screw in very far, just a couple threads should stick out on the other side. Just like that. So let's try it out. All right, I've got the carb reinstalled and fueled up. So let's give it a quick try. Let's see if we can get it to start in one pull and turn that choke fully off. I would call that a pass. Started first pull 
and the engine ran well. So let's get the airbox on, although I think I just destroyed this gasket. So we'll put a new one of those on. It's actually not too bad, but I've got more. Probably should have installed this after the back was on, but not the front of the airbox. Anyway, this is just the breather. It connects the valve cover over to the airbox to recirculate some of the blow by in the engine. That should do. It really isn't that bad in there. I am gonna drain it though and put some evaporust in there and just let it sit overnight to clean it up a little bit more. There's still a little bit of fuel in the tank that's not coming out. So I'm going to get the fuel petcock off and just drain off the last bit. I also noticed this fuel petcock, it's not the right part. It only accepts quarter inch line and the carburetor is 3 16 So that is going to have to be swapped out. Probably a good thing we pulled that out. The filter is clogged up with rust. That's why the tank wouldn't fully drain. It's definitely a good thing I removed that filter. A lot of rust came out, and you can see the color of this fuel is not nearly as good as the first bit that came out. That said, this is still good fuel. It can be cleaned up. So I'm going to filter the cleaner stuff with a coffee filter. And this stuff I'm gonna pre-filter with a paper towel, and then I'll try a coffee filter. The coffee filters work really well, but they also clog up really easily with this amount of debris in the fuel.
Nasty. I'm gonna put this back on, minus the fuel filter, just to hold the evaporost in the tank. So remember what it looks like. I'm going to give it about 12 hours, then we'll check in on it. While I'm waiting for the evaporus to do its thing, I'm going to pull this hour meter out and move it on over since this is the one that goes with that engine that's on the other frame now. Plus the meter on the other frame does not even work. We're actually at the 24 hour mark. After 12 hours, I didn't notice a huge difference. And at the 24 hour mark, yeah, it's hard to tell. I wouldn't say it's dramatic, the difference. Certainly not worse. Anyway, I'm gonna let it sit, I'd say at least for another 24 hours and check back. We're at the 48 hour mark and things are looking pretty good. All the rust is gone at this point, so I think it's time to get that evaporust out of there.
going to install a new fuel petcock. It has the correct 3 16 barb on it as well as a new fuel filter. A little bit of WD-40 makes that fuel line slide right into place. As far as the tank vent goes, I'm going to leave it just attached to the frame rail here. Most tanks just have a vented cap. I think this system is most likely a result of some California legislation where in theory, I guess it's a little better because it recirculates it through the engine, but generators, they're off most of the time. And when it's off, it's just venting to atmosphere. And the engine that's on here is 13 years old. It only has 41 hours on it. So yeah, most of the time it's not doing anything useful. I alluded to an issue here earlier that we were missing the bushing for the tank. And I do have a bunch from old generators that didn't make it. And this one, I think, is the right size. So as long as we have three more of those, which it looks like we do, then we should be good to go. One of the more important parts, make sure you secure this wire here because it can get sucked into the rotor and it'll destroy your power head. So I usually use a zip tie like this where it can be attached like there with a bolt. If you don't have that, just a zip tie around these two wires should be enough to keep it in place. Maybe one right here, too. This protective film has been on here for quite a while. And at some point, it doesn't like to come off. And I think we've passed that point. So I'm going to fight with this for a minute.
right. It is the moment of truth. We know the engine runs. We know the generator makes power. But can it pull 5,500 watts? You know, that is what we're going to find out now. So we're going to start the engine. We'll let it warm up a bit. And then we'll slowly bring the load up to the max of 5,500 watts, which is just shy of 23 amps at 240 volts. So we get the ignition on, fuel and choke on. We're actually starting off pretty good at about 4 or 5% THD. Voltage is 243 volts and the hertz. We're actually a little bit slow at 58 hertz, so let's bring that up to 61 and a half hertz and check back. All right, so now according to the amp probe, we're at 61.5 hertz, 244 volts, and the THD is at 4.7%. All right, so let's bring a load on now. We're gonna start at 2,000. Plus another thousand, so we're now at 3,000 watts. We're holding fine at 241 volts. The THD came up quite a bit to 20%. And the Hertz, just fine at 60.4. All right, let's go for the max. We're gonna swap a thousand for two thousand, so we're now up four thousand watts. Five thousand, fifty-five hundred, and you can see we're just at twenty-three amps. Voltage is fine at two hundred forty volts. Hertz, fifty-nine point two. The THD, twenty-one point nine. Not too bad. It's doing pretty well at the rate of load. Let's try 6,000 watts. No issues. So out of curiosity, let's try 6,500 watts. So we'll bring it up back to 6,000. Nope, that's too much. So it can do 6,000, assuming the circuit breaker holds. But overall, not too bad. So overall, this thing performed pretty well. I mean, without a load, we started at 244 volts and under a full load, it held at 240 volts. So very little movement in the voltage. Uh, the engine speed also did very well. At no load, we were at 61 and a half hertz. And under a full load, we dropped a bit 
to about 59 and a half hertz. So the engine's doing very well. You know, I actually was able to hold 6,000 watts without issue. It wasn't until 6,500 watts where we started to lose engine speed. Now the THD, you know, I thought for a second there we might end up with a clean machine. You know, it started at about 4% harmonic distortion, but it quickly went up. Under 3,000 watts, it jumped to 20%. And under a full load of 5,500 watts, it came up to 22%. So, yeah, not great for sensitive electronics. You know, pretty typical, though, of what you would get today in this price range. So, yeah, in the end, this generator turned out pretty well. You know, it was a gamble going into it. But, you know, I always had a plan B. You know, I had that other Generac that had basically an engine and nothing else. And then we had this, which was complete but had a possible engine problem. And of course, as we found out, it had a very serious problem. Now, this isn't the first Generac I've worked on that has had issues with the cam. And actually, all of those had issues internally with rust. And in this case, it kind of looked like varnish. So I'm kind of wondering here if it's a materials issue. You know, is this stuff just rusting out real easy? You know, or maybe is it an oil issue? You know, I don't know if these machines came with oil when they were new. You know, potentially it was the original oil that was in the original engine and maybe it went bad, which caused all that damage. You know, I am not really sure, but I am fairly confident that it wasn't water. You know, I don't think this was underwater. I don't think the engine had water in it. You know, I think something went wrong chemically with the oil that was in there. But I'm not sure. So let me know in the comments what you think. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.